I want you to meet Betty. Betty's my mum. She's 94. She lives in Liverpool, where I was born. And 35 years ago, my wife and I moved down south near London. So we go and visit her in the car. It's a journey that used to take about three hours. And then it took about four hours. And now it takes about five hours. It's getting worse, and it's got to the point where it's actually very difficult to get there and back in the same day. And you might say, well, why don't you take the aeroplane? But you know, aeroplanes are increasingly having problems as well. And I have to tell you, yesterday I flew up from Gatwick to be here, and as you know, that should be an hour and a half journey. Actually, it was a three and a half hour delay, and it was five hours. I sat there at the airport and thought of the irony of coming here to talk to you all about today about transportation problems while sitting for a plane that was delayed three and a half hours. We've all got transportation stories like this. I'm sure you all have. And it, it seems like travel is just sucking time out. It's sucking our productivity out, and it seems to be getting worse. And the data supports that. Actually, based on an average lifespan of 80 years, about 5% or four years of our lifetime is spent on business and personal travel. Just think about that. That's terrible. And actually, we're the lucky ones, because if you're in emerging markets, that figure is about six years. Is this what we have to accept? Is there really nothing we can do but watch these numbers get bigger? I think there is something we can do, and I'd like to explain what it is. And I'd like to do that by starting off with the most important question, which is, can we reverse time? Can we give time back? And to solve that, why is travel so bad? Now, this picture could easily be my daily commute from where I live into central London. It takes about the same time as it always used to, but actually the difference is I used to get a seat, and now I never get a seat. And that is the daily experience for millions of people all the way around the world. If you ask people why that is, they say things like, well, it's because we're not investing in infrastructure. Well, it's because there's just more of us traveling right now. And then the latest on the BBC News this morning, ah, the new one is, it's because we've separated the people who operate the trains to the people who run the tracks. Now, I'm sure there's truth in all of that, but I think there's actually a much more obvious reason why. And that is that what we're really trying to do is get incremental improvements out of a 200-year-old analog system. I mean, the train, when it was invented in the 1820s, was massively radical. It replaced the horse for millions of people. But it was an engine pulling a carriage that ran on steel wheels and steel rails. And since then, what have we done? Well, we've improved it. We've improved it a lot. We've made it a lot faster. And now, what have we got? We've got new high-speed trains, which are electric engines pulling carriages running on steel wheels, on steel rails. And it doesn't matter how much more money we pump into this, you get the law of diminishing returns, where the more you spend, the less you get back, and actually you reach the tipping point where things just start to get worse. And I believe that that's where we are. We don't need to incrementally improve legacy systems. What we need to is do is radically reinvent them, and that's what the Hyperloop is. Now, the Hyperloop, from a technology point of view, is a pod. It's a vehicle that you can put people and freight in. It propels forward on an electric motor. It lifts by electromagnetic uh, levitation. It goes in a tube where we take most of the air out. In fact, the air equivalent to the air pressure at 220,000 feet, which means once it's levitating, it glides, held in place by the magnetic field, and turn all the power off, and it glides and then it slows down and it stops. How fast? Up to 670 miles an hour. And what would that mean? The journey, which today takes four and a half hours from right here to central London, could be done in 50 minutes. 
Now, it's not just the speed of the Hyperloop that makes it fundamentally different. It's the experience that we'll all have. I mean, we all know trains stop at every station. They're not high speed when they stop. And they stop regardless of whether or not you want to get off or not. But with Hyperloop, every journey is direct to destination from anywhere else. The pod you get in only goes to where you want to go. And there's no timetable for a Hyperloop. The pod leaves when you want it to leave, because you order it via your smartphone. In fact, you can also order the other modes of transportation, like, in this case, an Uber for the first mile and the last mile, so you can have an on-demand journey door-to-door -door from anywhere. And a third way in which it's different is just the way in which it is powered. It runs completely on electricity off the grid. Once it's levitating, you turn everything off. In fact, for those areas of the world that are blessed with a lot of sunshine, you can actually not only have carbon neutral, it will generate electricity for those communities. Now, this sounds too good to be true, right? It's, it's incredible. Is it science fiction? Is that, is that what we're talking about? Well, I don't think so, because we've already built a prototype of what a Hyperloop is. And what you're looking at is the world's first Hyperloop. It's a 500-meter long track in the Nevada desert in California. You see the pod put into the tube. The pod moves forward on, on the uh, electric motor. It levitates. It runs in the vacuum here. It's running at about 245 miles an hour. It doesn't touch the sides. It slows down, and it stops. So if we prove the basic technology, the question is, where is it going to be implemented first? And I would contend that this is a leading candidate. What you're looking at is the road from Mumbai to Pune in India. It's about 140 kilometers. It's about a two and a half hour journey, and 130 million passenger journeys are made a year, and a lot of them are return trips. The Maharashtra government said they want to build a hyperloop that will take that two and a half hour journey and reduce it to 25 minutes. Now just think about that. So you're spending five hours a day traveling just to make a living, and now you're going to do it in an hour. You're going to get four hours back. Millions of Indians are going to have the choice whether to work more because they want to earn more money, or to spend time with family, friends, or just simply to get home before the kids go to bed. And from the Indian government's point of view, $55 billion of wider economic benefits have been calculated for this one route, for a system that costs less than high-speed rail and will be live in about seven years. So let's dream a little. If this happens, what could Hyperloop do? for our world. Well, I would contend that just like the internet, we first thought it was all about speed, but actually it turned out to be all about business model enablement and disruption. I think it's going to be the same here. It allows us to question certain business models. The perceived wisdom that says, if you need more airport capacity, you put one more runway in an already crowded airport. What if we were to connect existing airports together and use the combined runway capacity, allow people to go to any of those airports and get to any other in transfer times that are equivalent to going between terminals in today's model. What if we could solve the problem of e-commerce where we're all buying things online, but it means all these white vans are going on our roads, the traffic's actually getting worse because of e-commerce. Why can't we distribute freight packetize freight over vast distances the same day and only physically deliver the last mile. In fact, it's been calculated that a Hyperloop system could deliver freight the same day across entire continents. For example, North America, five hours coast to coast. What if we could give people choice about where they live and where they work? You know, the London underground system has transformed London. We all know that. Average journeys are about an hour from anywhere to anywhere. But it's not a benefit that's been shared across the whole of the UK. What the Hyperloop could do is take that model and stretch it. Stretch it to encompass an entire country. So 
all the cities. The urban connotations could be connected in journey times of less than an hour. Can't afford a one-bedroom flat in London anymore? No problem. Buy a three-bedroomed house in Leeds and get to Canary Wharf in 30 minutes. And it will allow us, as a society, to actually truly meet our obligations for the Paris Accord. Transport accounts for 30% of carbon emissions. This carbon-free system that could generate electricity will then also have massive implications on things like air quality for the communities that put it in. So, can we do it? Well, we clearly can, because 200 years ago, some engineers had an idea, some entrepreneurs got together, they built the first train, the finance people came in, the government said yes, okay, and the regulators approved it. So, of course, we can do it. The more important question is, will we do this? And I think we have to. Is our legacy to our children and their children really going to be gradually degrading transportation systems? We have it within our grasp now to collapse time and distance in a way we'd never seen before. And if we do that, it's not only going to change all of your lives, it's going to result in a network of hyperloops around the world that will transform the lives of billions of people in a way that today they can really only dream and hope for. We can do this. We should do this. I believe we have to do this. This should be our legacy to the next generation. Thank you very much.